Hi, Eva. Hey there. Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you very much for being here. Let me introduce us. I am Philip Menchaca, uh, editor at bloggingheads.tv, and you are Eva Galperin, director of cybersecurity for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. That's right. And uh, we are going to talk today about uh, privacy and security um, generally, and specifically talk a little bit about net neutrality and uh, maybe some uh, state-sponsored malware um, issues. But first, can you just tell me what the EFF does? Sure. Uh, EFF stands for Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we are a digital civil liberties organization that has been around since 1990. And our job is to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. <laughs> so what are some of the current projects that the EFF is engaged in? Well, the EFF is currently a vast undertaking, so there are a lot of us working on different things. Uh, but one of the most interesting about our approach is that we have uh, this sort of unique combination of, uh, of tools and skills that we can bring to the table, sort of like the Justice League. Um, so sometimes the problems that face the Internet uh, require, a, uh, require a lawyer. Uh, and then we, we file lawsuits. We do what's called impact litigation. So we file a lawsuit with the intention of getting a ruling that, uh, that will impact people uh, further down the line. This is a lot of the kind of thing that the ACLU does uh, for uh, civil liberties, both online and offline. Um, we also have activists for when you need to get people out onto the streets, when you need people to sign petitions, when you need people to write letters or call their, uh, their senators or congressmen. Um, and we also have... Uh, a bunch of engineers, and what our engineers do is sometimes they build um, they build tools like the Chrome extensions that we run, uh, like um, HTTPS Everywhere and Privacy Badger. We're also part of the of the group that works on uh, CertBot, which is also known as Let's Encrypt, making it really easy for people to get uh, free SSL certificates for their websites. Um, and we also do research into um, the kinds of problems that people in especially vulnerable populations have. So we have a uh, we have a website called Surveillance Self Defense, uh, which is our privacy and security guide. Uh, and we go around doing trainings. We um, also uh, do reports on uh, sort of dangers to privacy and security online to vulnerable populations, including state-sponsored malware, which is a, a fairly large part of my work. And we do sort of policy work around this sort of thing as well. So sometimes you have to go to the Hill or you have to go to like the U European Court of Human Rights and talk to them about why the internet is important and why the kind of rights that you have offline should also be the kind of rights that you have online. Yeah, great. So you have a, a whole bunch of tools <laughs> at your disposal at the EFF, um, involved in a lot of different things. I uh, actually use some of the extensions, um, such as Privacy Badger and, and HTTPS Everywhere, which um, you know, encrypts your access to certain to the websites when you browse online. Um, so I, I recommend people go and uh, check out some of these some of this information and resources that EFF has um, so that's what the EFF does and uh, to, to kind of kick off our conversation here I want to uh, talk with you about an issue that's been in the news recently uh, again it's sort of a slow burning actually I think years long issue now at this point um, and that is net neutrality uh, and this is just to kind of set what the controversy is right now, the FCC is uh, looking at repealing some uh, Obamacare, uh, uh, not Obamacare, some rules. <laughs> well, that's also Obamacare. Also Obamacare. <laughs> that's another topic. Um, looking at repealing some rules that were put in place under Obama um, that protected net neutrality. Um, mm -hmm. But just to start off basic, can you define what people mean when they say net neutrality? All right. So net neutrality is is not a law like the law of gravity. Uh, it's sort of a a principle that uh, that cert that companies and uh, I that ISPs have uh, abided by for many years. And the idea is that um, 
a packet is a packet is a packet. And what the what an ISP does is it moves packets and it treats all of those packets the same. And if you are going to one website, you should not be able to get better bandwidth um, than if you are going to some other band, uh, website. And the reason why net neutrality is, uh, is so important is because if you have this sort of pay for play system where uh, people can pay for better, uh, you know, so for better treatment by ISPs or preferential treatment uh, by ISPs for their bandwidth, then uh, the companies that with a lot of money and with pre-existing relationships with the ISPs or that are owned by the ISPs are at an unfair advantage. And new companies that have you know, new ideas and new services that are up and coming or are startups are at a disadvantage. So this would have a tremendously um, uh, chilling effect on, uh, on startups and anybody who doesn't necessarily have a lot of money from the very beginning. So if uh, so, these rules were put in place under Obama to kind of keep an even playing field. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so particular companies couldn't pay, uh, say, Verizon to boost their speed or or not throttle uh, the speed of their website. Um, so I guess. Absolutely. So the, the worry here is that, uh, for instance, a, a, a company like uh, Verizon or, or Comcast, um, who is an internet service provider and provides internet to people, um, could selectively choose which websites run well on your browser. Um, is that accurate? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and for a very long time, it, it, for a very long time, EFF's position on net neutrality uh, could best be uh, described by teams of like Jesuit priests. It was so complicated. And part of the reason for this is because EFF has a, a lifetime, uh, a lifelong aversion to um, to regulation. We have been touched in a bad place by FCC regulation before, and we don't necessarily want the FCC uh, sticking their, their noses in, uh, in our business because historically uh, this has not been good for leveling the playing field or for, uh, for increasing the competitiveness of startups or anything like that. The only reason why EFF really turned around on this issue and said, fine, this is actually a situation where the FCC needs to get involved um, is because the ISPs themselves stated that it was their intention to do this. And we think that this is tremendously bad uh, for competition. This is tremendously bad for innovation. And it's very bad for users. And it's our job to stand up for the users. Yeah. So what can people do about uh helping preserve net neutrality? Well, there are a couple of things that you can do, but probably the most important is you can write to the FCC. The FCC is currently seeking comment on what people think about uh, their rolling back their regulations. And you can find a uh, on, on the EFF website, there is a button on our homepage that you can press on uh, that will allow you to contact the FCC and let them know what you think, along with some suggested language that you absolutely don't have to stick to. Uh, we have also taken part in the um, in a joint letter that uh, was just sent to the FCC, written by uh, 190 uh, network engineers, talking about why, from a uh, from a network standpoint and from a purely technical standpoint, uh, net neutrality is really important, and gutting it is not a good idea. Okay, great. And there was a big push, I think, uh, was it last week, um, to try to, to put the word out about the FCC accepting comments. Um, do you have, Absolutely. Do you happen to know what the uh, outcome of that was? Um, I mean, in, in terms of participation? Uh, um, I do know that the participation is very high, but I don't have any exact numbers. Uh, there, There is a long history, especially from the last time that the net neutrality debate came up, of... Uh, of the comments crashing the FCC website, uh, largely because um, while EFF is able to move a lot of people to action, probably the biggest uh, contributor 
to this the sort of uh, pro net neutrality speech, weirdly has been John Oliver over on HBO. And usually when he has an episode about net neutrality on his show, people respond in the kind of numbers that EFF can only dream of. <laughs> yes, I believe he had a uh, he he set up a, a website go fcc yourself.com i believe yes <laughs> uh that that would redirects you to the uh comments section on the on the fcc um website there's also been there's also been a really interesting trend of uh of bots leaving uh anti net neutrality comments and so it's really important to get real people coming to the site and, and giving their real views in order to balance out the sort of astroturfing that uh, anti-net neutrality campaigners have unleashed on the FCC website. That's very interesting. So, so people have created uh, you know, automated uh, spamming bots, I guess, to leave, mm -hmm. leave comments in, uh, in support or in, against net neutrality. Yeah, it's an incredibly worrisome trend. Yeah, I hadn't heard that before. That's... Uh... <laughs> That's unfortunate. Um, so the, the, the next thing, um, to kind of switch gears, um, I know that you're, one of your areas of expertise is uh, state-sponsored malware. Um, yes. And so I'd like to, to talk to you about, about that a little bit in, uh, in the context of, of kind of a recent um, story that has uh, broken about what seems like the Mexican government's use of a particular kind of malware called uh, Pegasus. Um, it's this spyware. Um, and for people who haven't heard of this, uh, would you be able to give a, a recap of um, just very broad overview of kind of what what's happened here? All right. Well, let's just start with what state-sponsored spyware is. Right. So I imagine that most of the people in your audience are familiar with spyware. That you can you can covertly load a program onto somebody's device, which could be you know their computer or their tablet or their phone, that gives you full control over that device. This allows you to see their and log their keystrokes, take uh, screenshots, make use of their microphone, make use of your um, of the camera. Uh, if you have full control over somebody's phone, that's tremendously powerful because you also get uh, their uh, their GPS location at all times. It's essentially like putting a tracking device in somebody's pocket. Uh, you can also spy on all of their phone calls. It's tremendously invasive. Um, now, spyware is pretty ubiquitously available. Uh, it is possible to buy spyware for you know 40 or 50 euro online that uh, that has much of the same functionality as the stuff that governments buy. Uh, but when governments decide that they want to uh, purchase and deploy spyware, uh, generally they don't uh, show up um, and deploy a 50 euro uh, copy of JRAT. Uh, what they do is uh, they either um, build the software uh, themselves, and this is particularly common in uh, in the Five Eyes countries. I, I don't know if your audience is familiar with who would qualify as Five Eyes, but that would be um, America, uh, Canada, the UK, New Zealand, and Australia, who all have a, a very close um, sort of uh, surveillance community relationship because everybody speaks English. Uh, you also see this in Russia, in China. Increasingly, you see it in places like North Korea and Vietnam. Uh, so these guys roll their own. They, they have armies of trained professionals who build the spyware uh, specifically so that it is very difficult for uh, antivirus companies to find it. But companies, uh, or sorry, countries that don't have this kind of money uh, to pay you know, tons of engineers to uh, build them custom software all the time, sometimes go uh, to third-party vendors. And these vendors include companies like um, FinFisher, uh, which is located, I believe, in the UK and Germany, uh, Italian companies like uh, Hacking Team, and um, also this, the, this company Dark Matter in the UAE, 
and a company called NSO Group in, uh, in Israel. So NSO Group sold their, uh, their software uh, to a number of different nation states, and they insist that they that they only sell to nation states, and they tell the uh, they tell the countries we're going to sell you this incredibly powerful and uh, and intrusive software, on the condition that you only use it um, against bad guys and terrorists. They have no way of knowing that this is going to happen, uh, but that's that's what they say they they do. Uh, so they went ahead, they sold this software to, uh, to Mexico, and it turns out that uh, the various members of the Mexican government used it to spy on um, activists and scientists who were working, on, uh, were working to support a uh, soda tax. Definitely not... Uh, not terrorism. Definitely not terrorism. <laughs> Uh, and um, most uh, most recently, they discovered that, uh, among other things, they were also spying on like the, the the children and the lawyers and all kinds of other people who were related to this particular situation. Um, and furthermore, they discovered that uh, that someone in the Mexican government was also using this to spy on a panel that was uh, that was convened to um, to look into the disappearance of. 40 students in Mexico a couple years ago. The disappearance of the students was a very big deal. It was a very large political issue. People went out onto the streets and they protested en masse for months on end, demanding that the government figure out what happened to these students. And it became the sort of symbol for uh, how little control uh, the federal government has um, over, you know, sort of day-to-day -day life in Mexico and how little control they have over, uh, over the cartels. Um, so this independent panel was brought in to investigate, and it turns out the Mexican government was spying on them using NSO Group's uh, Pegasus uh, software. So again, not terrorists. <laughs> um, what's particularly interesting about this was again uh, the NSO group said, but we but we insist you only sell uh, we only sell to governments who tell us that they're going to use this uh, to spy on uh, to spy on terrorists. How can we possibly know that they might misuse this? It's like, well, maybe you might want to have wanted to read Citizen Labs report from six months ago or Citizen Lab Labs report from eight months ago, or if you don't read Citizen Lab reports, perhaps the New York Times. <laughs> It might, it's come up once or twice, but you keep selling to these guys. Uh, and this is also true of, uh, of some of the other um, really shady companies that have, have uh, engaged in this kind of sale. Right. Uh, so it's all very bad. So this is, uh, yeah, this is very, very troubling, very powerful software that repressive regimes or just corrupt regimes um, can use to gather information on journalists and, and citizens and activists um, having a really, you know, repressive uh, effect on citizens. Um, so mm -hmm. are there are there any kinds of uh, export controls that countries have on this kind of technology? Well, a couple of years ago, I would say like back in 2013, uh, when we started looking into this stuff and writing reports, um, many of the European countries stepped up and said, uh, really what we need to do is um, we need to stop these Western countries from selling uh, this software to authoritarian states. And the way that we're going to do this is through export controls and specifically through a thing that's known as the Vosnar arrangement, uh, which is uh, it's not a treaty. Uh, it's not legally binding. But uh, I think like 49 countries are signatories to it. And uh, this is the arrangement by which people or by which countries agree to limit um, the sale of, uh, of um, weapons. So actual physical weapons, things like landmines and guns and tanks and uh, the things that could be used to make landmines and guns and tanks. And then they expanded the language in the Vassenar arrangement um, to include uh, sort of surveillance software. Unfortunately, the language was expanded in such a way that um, it could be used to um, sort of chill 
the kind of re exactly the kind of research that unveiled these kinds of abuses in the first place, which I think is extremely alarming. Uh, they would make it uh, this language could be used to make it much more difficult for me to do my job if I'm collaborating with people who are outside of the United States, which I frequently do. Uh, furthermore, the kind of software that is used in the building of, uh, of surveillance malware or the analysis of surveillance malware is the kind of software that gets used in all kinds of other things. And so this language is extremely problematic. Um, I don't think that the Vossenar arrangement or export controls have to this date ever been used against surveillance researchers. But uh, one of the things that EFF is extremely wary of is just leaving tools out there that could be used against surveillance researchers one day saying, oh, surely no one will misuse this stuff. It's going to be fine. Uh, so we're extremely skeptical about this sort of thing. And in the meantime, uh, there is not a lot of evidence that the Vassanar arrangement has actually stopped companies from selling this kind of software to uh, company uh, to countries that then turn around and uh, and misuse it, and you can see that in the UAE, and you can see it in um, in Mexico, and more importantly, you can see it from a couple of years ago when a hacker who goes by the name of Phidias Fisher uh, dumped the mail spool of one of these uh, sort of bad actor companies called Hacking Team. You can actually see their discussion of this new language in the Vassenar arrangement, and they just go, Puh. it doesn't stop them one bit. It doesn't prevent a single sale. It didn't even like constitute a bump in the road for them. Uh, so this language doesn't work and it could potentially be used for a lot of bad things, which leaves us with the question of, so what do we do? Right. You know, so <laughs> we're... So we're not going to solve this problem by using export controls and export controls are only seeming to to make uh, potentially matters worse for people like me. Uh, so how do we stop this? And there are a couple of different ways. Uh, one of the things that EFF has done is we've caught um, we've we've caught governments spying on people inside of the United States. We had this case called Kidane versus Ethiopia, in which uh, it turns out that the Ethiopian government had installed surveillance malware on um, on the computer of a guy living in Silver Springs, Maryland. Um, we know that they spied on his Google searches and on his uh, on his Skype calls, and this is a violation of the wiretapping statute. Uh, in uh, in Maryland. So we went ahead and we sued. Um, unfortunately, this was not a case that we won. We actually got a really disappointing ruling where the judge refused to really um, uh, work with the substantive issue. Like he, he wouldn't even get into this whole idea that if a foreign government wants to spy on Americans in America, they need to follow the law here. They need to get a warrant. They need to get an MLAT. They have to, they, they have to, Play by the rules. Um, and what courts are really scared of is that this will limit American uh, ability to spy on people abroad, which is to say that other governments will say, hey, you need to follow the law when you want to spy on people in our country. Uh, we here at EFF are tremendous fans of the rule of law, and we think that would be a fine idea. <laughs> so we're working on it. I think uh, Kidane versus Ethiopia will not be our last case in the matter. We're still, uh, we've, got, we've got a few tricks left up our sleeves. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, actually, is how you think the law has responded to some of these, uh, you know, new questions brought by technology. Um, the law is in, in, our, in our court system. Um, they move slowly um, sometimes, and uh, they're not um, necessarily the most a a adaptable institution, I think. Um, do you think that's... I mean, number one, do you think that's a fair assessment? Number two, um, are you seeing that play out in, in litigation that EFF has, has been involved in? 
Oh, that's that there. There are basically two reasons why EFF does impact litigation. One of one of the reasons is that sometimes the law moves uh, lags too far behind technology, and then you end up with these like really really awful unforeseen impacts. The other is that sometimes the law is made by people who don't understand the technology, and that's why we have a whole staff of technologists whose job it is to go to people on the hill and. Uh, and explain the technology to them so that they don't make bad law in the first place or so that we're able to strike down bad law. Though my personal favorite is when we can stop bad law before it happens. <laughs> That's always That's a, the ideal. a better feeling. Um, so yeah, I think you've really, you've really got two problems there and they're, they're both things that EFF works on. Yeah. Uh, turning to the domestic front, uh, I'm, I, I'm personally alarmed by the idea of uh, government surveillance tools in the hands of the Trump administration. Um, and so um, my question is, you know, is that, is that fear justified? Um, are we, has the administration taken any particular actions with regard to surveillance or privacy in the past six months that uh, are particularly concerning? Well, to begin with, um, EFF has been suing the U.S. government over, uh, or actually, we have been suing either the ISPs or the U.S. government over their uh, over the NSA's warrantless uh, surveillance since 2006. We yeah. didn't like it when Bush was doing it. We didn't like it when Obama was doing it. And we don't like it when Trump is doing it. I think that regardless of who is in power. Uh, you know, warrantless wiretapping and mass surveillance is not a good idea. And we oppose it uh, absolutely, no matter who is in charge. Uh, I don't think that I've seen a lot of evidence that uh, that Trump is noticeably worse than Obama on this. But Obama was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, I, I think that there's there's a, a lot of assumption that um because EFF is viewed as a sort of left-leaning organization that we automatically have just this love of the Obama administration. Um, but we, we fight for the users and we fight for civil liberties. We are on the side of civil liberties. And if you are on the wrong side, we will come for you. Um, and so we spent a lot of time criticizing the Obama administration for their lack of transparency, um, all while billing themselves the most transparent administration ever. Uh, and we have exactly the same criticisms of uh, of the Trump administration. Right. And things like, uh, you know, the, the Surveillance Act, looks 702, um, mm -hmm. it has not gone away. And it's not, uh, you know, it's possibly... Well, 702, 702 can still sunset. Right. In, de and in December? So every time 702 right? comes... Yes. So every time 702 comes up for sunset... Uh, we we show up on the hill and we we try to get uh, our our base uh, to come out and explain that it's extremely important that we sunset 702 and that having this sort of surveillance state forever forever amen is not a good idea and does not benefit um, civil liberties. Now, in fact, it doesn't even make us safer. Yeah, uh, I mean, I agree with you on that one. Um, what what would you, some people would say in, in response to this? Uh, well, you know, if if people, if you're not doing something wrong, if you're not committing a crime, um, then you don't have anything to worry about. What would your response be to that? Well, um, there are a lot of different responses to this. <laughs> there are a lot of ways that you can take it. But I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that in the end, everybody has something to hide. Uh, there is a reason why we lock our doors, why, why we close our curtains. Um, privacy is one of the most fundamental, basic uh, rights that you have as an American, and it is also a fundamental human right. Um, the government does not have the right to come into your home without a warrant and look through your stuff. And we think that this also applies to the digital realm, especially when um, the the information available about you when somebody searches the, the digital realm is so detailed and so incredibly personal. Um, and so that really speaks to the to the core of our mission. Furthermore, even if you feel like you don't have anything to hide, maybe, you know, you uh, all your doors are unlocked and maybe you don't wear pants and maybe you're, you're just like living life all out there in the open. Um, not everyone is in a position to do that. 
uh, the the world is is full of people who uh, who have things to hide who are not up to no good. Right. Uh, if you are, for example, a um, a woman. Uh, on the internet with opinions, let me tell you, you have things to hide because people will, will come after you and harass you. And the same thing is true of uh, of Muslims and people of color. It's true of people with unpopular political opinions. It's, people, it's true of people with unpopular religious beliefs. And so even if you feel like you don't have something to hide, it's really important to protect this right for these other people. For, I mean, for one thing, somewhere down the line, you could become one of them. Right. And then you would regret that potential stance that you had in the past once it begins yep. affecting you. Uh, One day they're going to come for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so what are some things that people can do to secure their own privacy online? Um, well, specifically, uh, EFF has a website that we have devoted entirely to uh, security and privacy advice, and it's called Surveillance Self-Defense. You can get there at ssd.eff.org. Um, probably the, the most common things that I suggest to people are, um, update your software, please, please, please update your software, uh, use a password manager so that you have, uh, long, strong and unique passwords for all of your, um, for all of your accounts, uh, turn on 2FA for accounts where 2FA is available, um, 2FA uh, through an application like Authy or uh, Google Authenticator is better than 2FA through SMS, which is not always the best thing. But uh, for, for many people, 2FA through SMS is better than nothing. And, and that's uh, uh, when websites have you enter a separate code in addition to your password in order to log yes. in? Mm -hmm. When you enter, uh, when you enter uh, a website by just giving your username and login, what you're giving them is uh, one factor of authentication. And so 2FA stands for two-factor authentication, and that second factor is a special one-time code that you are sent in order to uh, log into your website. And what this means is that if somebody steals um, or copies or somehow intercepts your password and uh, they try to log in with it, without that second code, they're still not getting in. And that is a uh, fantastic protection that I think everybody should have. Yeah. And are there particular uh, behaviors that people should be aware of when they're online or, or, you know, things they should do or not do when they're browsing, you know, Facebook or wherever? Well, I think everybody really has a different appetite for risk. Some people look at a roller coaster and they go, there's no way I'm getting on that. And some people look at a roller coaster and they go, this is a great time. I would like to spend all day riding roller coasters. And the internet is really much the same. Uh, one of the things that I really would recommend is uh, taking a look at your sort of social media profiles and uh, seeing what can be gleaned about you by a stranger. So log out of Facebook and take a look at your Facebook profile and see whether or not you're giving away any information about yourself that you uh, would really rather people did not know. And the same thing is true for, you know, Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, just get an idea of what a, what a stranger can see about you and put together. Uh, and, and that's usually sort of the the very beginning of a risk assessment. And what you do from there is really going to depend on your appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, great, Eva. I think we will leave it there. Um, I do encourage everyone to, to, to check out the work that EFF is doing. Um, you know, I think it's very important. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for, for coming on Blogging Heads. All right, thank you. Thank you.